related by blood, same mother, same father. The brotherhood of Iman takes precedence over that. This was, in my opinion, not illustrated any better than the uh, well-known Sahabi Mus'ab ibn Umayr. And it's the amazing thing about it is the incident that I'm about to narrate to you took place before this verse was revealed. It happened after the Battle of Badr. When he, when the Muslims were fighting the Quraysh, you know the Muhajirun, they are Quraysh themselves, most of them. So they were, weren't fighting some uh, alien enemy. They weren't fighting some unknown enemy. They were fighting their family. A, a tribe of, is a big family. Everybody's related at some point. So you find in this battle of Badr, the first time that truth came against falsehood and the Muslims were outnumbered. You find many situations where the Muslims, the believers, fought their own brothers. Umar ibn al-Khattab, radiallahu ta'ala, and he killed his uncle in during this battle. Abu Ubaid ibn al-Jarrah, radiallahu ta'ala, and who? These are two of the companions that was promised paradise that I just named already. He killed his own father during the battle of Badr. He killed his own father. Mus'ab ibn Umayr, he, after the battle was over with, they were taking the prisoners of war back into Medina, and he saw his brother, Abul Aziz, being taken as a prisoner. And Abul Aziz, the one who's narrating the story, he later became Muslim, he's narrating the story, he saw his brother, so he thought to himself, oh good, my brother, you know, it's my brother, he's going to look out for me, maybe he can, you know, facilitate my release, or what have you. And when Mus'ab saw his brother, he saw the Ansar, who are not from Mecca, they're from Medina, bringing them back into Medina, he told the Muslim brother from amongst the Ansar, he said, tie him tight, don't let him get away. His mother got a lot of money, you get some good money for him. Abu Aziz said, whoa, this is the way you're going to talk about your brother? Mus'ab ibn Umayr said, you're not my brother. The one who's taking you prisoner, that's my brother. And this happened before this verse was revealed. In the Mount Mu'minun and Ephwa. I see who bain bain al-Aqawaitin. Therefore, make peace between the brothers. Rectify the situation between the brothers. Utaqullah, la'alakum turhamun. And fear Allah so that you would receive Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy. So you see in Islam that brotherhood is of the uppermost. You really can't do anything in Islam except with brotherhood and order. The brotherhood of Islam is serious. When the Prophet wasallam entered Medina, they had a wathika, an agreement for Medina, where it spelled out the relationship between everybody that lives in Medina. In that document, the Prophet ﷺ had it written that a Muslim cannot be killed on behalf of a disbeliever. So in other words, even if a Muslim brother does something wrong to a disbeliever, you don't take his life. There's some other punishment, but you can't kill him for the sake of the disbeliever. The brotherhood of Islam. First and foremost, bigger and more important than any and everything. I'm sure you see just from these few stories that we narrated how far we've come from that. We're very far away from that. We don't understand it. This brotherhood, extremely important. What is it based on? Based upon Iman, based upon faith. It's not based upon skin color. It's not based upon where you come from. But the brotherhood is based upon Iman. That's what makes us brothers. That's what makes us tight. Our belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The amazing thing about this, if you look and pay attention to what's going on around, around us, we all know what everybody's talking about. Ferguson, Missouri. What happened? A couple of months ago, an unarmed black teenager, black man, was shot by police and killed, lethal force. They took all of this time, about two months, to make public 
whether they were going to indict, charge the officer with shooting this unarmed black man. White police officer shoot, kills black man, unarmed. And you see everybody taking pictures and protesting with their hands up. Because as autopsy reports, reports prove that the victim had his hands up, you know, in a state of surrender when he was shot. And so there was a lot of protests on up until this time, still going on right now. Earlier this week, they announced that they will not be charging this officer. This officer acted correctly. He did his job properly, such and such and so and so. So a lot of people upset, rightfully so. Everybody's upset. Obviously, people who identify with the victim, Mike Brown, are extremely upset, black people. Because when we see that incident, and we know even since that time, there's been other incidents that have taken place. In Cleveland, a 12-year-old boy was shot and killed by police officers playing with a, a BB gun or a pellet gun or something like that. Lethal force. Even now there's a, a picture circulating around Facebook and other social media, and they have about eight or ten different victims that had encounters with police. And they're trying to show you the disparity that's taking place. Certain situations where white, quote-unquote, criminals had guns pointed at police, aiming, and the police apprehends them without using lethal force. And, it, and all, all of this, these things are recent as of this year. But then on the flip side, you have all of these black people who were, uh, who had encounters with police officers around the country. Some of them children, some of them unarmed, most of them unarmed, and they were killed. They weren't apprehended. They were killed. So the point is obvious. When police officers deal with black people for for the most part, you can expect to die. And when they deal with white people, the, you know, nine times out of ten, he will come out breathing. He won't, he won't be killed. They try to use every avenue to subdue or to apprehend the suspect without using lethal force to kill him. So naturally, because these things, they've been going on for a long time, it's nothing new. I just want to make that clear. This is nothing new. This didn't just start last year or the year before that. This has been going on since before I was born. The thing that makes it different now is because of technology. Everybody's phone has a camera on it. And YouTube, even YouTube, the restrictions are gone. I remember when I first was familiar with YouTube, you couldn't post a video longer than seven, eight minutes on it. And there was all types of limitations. Now you can post old movies on YouTube. So things are happening. Everybody has the ability to record. So every, everybody's recording everything. And all of this information is coming out. So it looks like it's a new phenomenon. It's not. It's been going on for a long time. So everybody's upset. And people wonder why. This thing is caught on videotape. There were 50 witnesses around. How is it possible that they cannot, that they not indict or charge these various different police officers with crimes. Inshallah, brothers, can we move up and form ranks? Inshallah, because brothers are coming in and they don't have any place to uh, pray, inshallah. This is where you're supposed to sit anyway, in ranks. How can they not charge him? This is wrong. And you know the amazing thing about this? The amazing thing about it is, when you look at, especially social media, you get to know what people are thinking. So they have websites and Facebook accounts, like in support of Darren Wilson, the officer who shot Mike Brown. Do you know that they started a GoFundMe account? GoFundMe is where you can raise money to support whatever cause. Any one of us can start that. They raised $500,000 almost, a, a hair under $500,000 in support of Darren Wilson, the police officer, when the thing first happened. They support their own. 
And allegedly, after he was cleared of all or any wrongdoing, allegedly, ABC got an exclusive interview with him, and allegedly he was paid $500,000 for that interview. So what's the message that is sent? If you kill a black man, you can get rich. So if these things are true, and we don't know all the other secret backdoor monies that's coming in, this man's a millionaire. And what did he do to earn that money? He was a law enforcement officer, and he killed a black man. You can even look at the same thing with Trayvon Martin. Zimmerman is paid. Anything he touches turns into gold. They raised money to support him. He wasn't even a police officer. He was a flashlight cop. It's a flashlight cop. A cop that don't really have no authority except for what the community says he has. And when he called the police on Trayvon Martin, they said, leave him alone. We're coming. Don't follow him. He followed him anyway and shot him. And he got off free. And we are, and, and it like it upsets us and it infuriates us. Like, how can this stuff be going on? That's not right. It's injustice. What you don't understand, and it's something that the Muslims a long time ago understood, but we don't get it. There's a brotherhood that exists between them. There's a brotherhood that exists between them, and they don't cross that line. Well, I'm really glad you're really glad. Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, wa afdulu salatu wa tamu tasleem, ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een, wa radiallahu ta'ala ala sadiq al-tabi'een, wa ulama al-amaleen, wa a'imatul arabat al-mujtahideen, wa muqalideen, wa kira yawmideen, amma ba'ad. There's a brotherhood that exists between them. And our brotherhood between us Muslims is supposed to be stronger than that. See, they have organization and they have brotherhood. When you become a police officer, there's an oath that you take to become a police officer. You don't just waltz in there. You take an oath. And the most important part about that oath is what's not said in the oath. Not exactly what's said. They, have, they swear to uphold the Constitution and various municipalities add stuff to it and tinker with it. But they take an oath to uphold the law. But what's not being said in the oath is that you're your brother's keeper. Your brother is that police officer that wears that uniform and that bag just like you. He needs to know that when his back is turned, you have his back and you're not going to let nothing happen to him. When you join, when you become part of the military, you take an oath. There's an oath of enlistment. You take an oath. You take a bayah. That's what it's called in Arabic. You take an oath. And you swear to protect all the, the, the Constitution and defend against all enemies, foreign and domestic. There's an oath. You swear to it. So you come in, this is something different. When you come into something and you take an oath, you know it's serious. Like, whoa, this ain't just, you know, no, no, this is your brother's here. I don't care what neighborhood you come from, Mr. Black Man, that's a police officer. I don't care what, what hood you from. I don't care what you did. You take this oath, your brother is your police, your, your brother from amongst the police officer. That's your brother. And when your brother does something wrong, you hold him down anyway. They call it the blue wall of silence. This is actually a corruption of what we're supposed to be doing. This is a corruption of what we're supposed to be doing. Anas ibn Malik radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Unsur ataka, dhaliman aw madhluma. Help your brother, whether he is the oppressor or he's the one being oppressed. Help your brother. Unsur ataka, help your brother. Dhaliman aw madhluma. Whether he's the one that's doing the oppression or he's the one who's being oppressed. Help him. Kalu ya Rasulullah. Hadha nansuruhu madhluma. Fa kaifa nansuruhu dhalima. They say, Ya Rasulullah, we understand how to help our brother if he's the one being oppressed. But how do we help him if he's the one doing the oppression? 
Qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Ta'kudhu fawqa yadayhi The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, you know, take his hands or in other words, stop him from doing no oppression. That's how you help your brother. But see, the way they understand it, they don't understand the last part. They just understand, help your brother whether he is the oppressor or he is the oppressed. Help him. They understand that. Help. Everybody that has any type of serious profession takes an oath. Everybody. You become a physician. You take the Hippocratic Oath. In the original Hippocratic Oath, you swore to a whole bunch of pagan gods, healing gods. They alter, they ain't changing, it varies from place to place, but you take an oath. You become a lawyer, you take an oath. You become a judge, you take an oath. You know the seriousness about what you're about to get involved in. So they take an oath. The people upset now, they don't have an answer. They don't know what to do. People feel as if their lives are in danger. You're being hunted. There's a target on you. And you can be killed, there's nothing you can do about it. Just shut up and take the bullet. So people are upset. They don't know what to do. Most of the people are coming up with things that have been done before and that and has failed. They're overlooking the elephant in the room. The elephant in the room is a phrase that people use when they're ignoring the obvious. Because obviously, think about it. We're in a room, just imagine if an elephant was in here. We all pretended we didn't see it. Just think about it. The elephant is huge. Just imagine an elephant being in here, even if it can fit. We just sitting talking, I'm giving a cookbook, you listen, you don't see this big thing, this trunk, and you're just, you're just ignoring it like it ain't there. That's the elephant in the room. The elephant in the room is that, number one, when you're dealing with issues, number one, you want to do things to alleviate the pain immediately. Even when you go to a doctor, the doctor may give you some pain medicine. That's not the cure. That's just to, to stop the discomfort. But you don't just stop with pain medicine. You want to get at the root of what's caused, what caused the pain. And you want to heal it. So some people protest. Sometimes protesting is needed. That's not going to stop the problem. Some people say, well, you need to get out the vote. People got out the vote. It's like, you know, it's, it's almost, it's laughable. Somebody said to me the amazing thing, matter of fact, one of my brothers here said, the amazing thing is, you have a black president, a black attorney general, still can't stop that. So you got out my vote. That's not going to stop anything. That's not going to change anything. Want to know why? Because the president of the United States of the North of America, the United States of America took an oath. He has an oath. People in Congress take an oath. Everybody take an oath. Now, I know some of you real intelligent, you want to go to Google and see what, what actually the oath says and what you got to say. A lot of times it's not what's being said. A lot of times it's not the letter of the law or the letter of the oath. It's the spirit of the oath. What's, going, what's not being said? What's not being said is that you ride or die, wrong or right, and you don't break ranks. Don't care what we do. You ride. If you don't like it, you shut up and take it. If I'm a white cop and you my black cop partner and we go to your hood and I start roughing up some of your people, you, you hold me down because you my brother. Not your hood where you came from. And if you dare break ranks, your life in jeopardy. Go on the internet and look up those police officers who voiced their disagreement with the way things were going in Ferguson, Missouri. They're very secretive about their identity. They hide. And they, they, when they get interviewed, you know, they clap the face out and change the voice. Why? Because they know that their life is in danger. They're going against the grave. They're violating their brotherhood. And as we said, this is a corruption of what they got from Islam. 
You notice during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, people didn't just take Shahada, they took Shahada and they took Bayah, especially after Medina. When the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was looking for people to accept his message, and the people from Yathrib, that we know as Medina, came through, and they met with him. It was actually three occasions, and then the second time, it, they, they took Bayah to Aqaba, the, the oath of Aqaba, the place outside of Mecca where they met at. It's called Aqaba. And they swore that they will uh, take him in, that they will support their, that they will support his message. Bantu Aqaba Thani, the second time, more people came out. And they took over, it was a little bit different. And they swore to protect him the way they were they way, the way they would protect their own women and children. They swore to protect the Prophet. They didn't just say, you know, oh, yeah, yeah, we got you. No. It was an oath. It was a bayah. Before he even had any authority, they gave him a bayah. And before they did it, one from amongst them said, hold up, stop, wait a minute. Do y'all know the seriousness of what y'all about to do? Do you know that if we proceed in this way, that we are making war with all of the other Arabs, including the Quraysh? Do you know what this means? This oath is serious. They say, yeah, we know exactly what we're doing. Now be quiet so we can take this oath. And they lived up to their oath. When Amr ibn al-As, when he became Muslim, this is after the Battle of the Khandaq, the Battle of the Ditch, he actually went to Abyssinia. They tried to play neutral for a minute. Long story short, uh, he had an audience with, with Amni Jashi, the Ethiopian king. And Amni Jashi just came straight out with him because he was Muslim on the down low at that time. And Amni Jashi said, when are you going to stop playing games, Ya Amr? Don't you know that this man, meaning Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is going to get victory over his enemies in the same way that Allah gave victory to Musa? Can't you see that? When are you going to stop playing games? And Amr said, is it really that? Is that really the case? It surprised me. He said, yes, that's the case. And he took his shahada. But they usually leave his part out. They don't really translate it properly. When you read the Arabic, he took his shahada and he took his bayah with Amni Jash. He gave his oath of allegiance and he took his shahada at the hand of Amni Jash, the Ethiopian king. And then he went back to Medina to do it with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa directly. On the road, who did he bump into? Khalid ibn Walid. And what is he doing? Going to Medina to do the same thing. To take his shahada and to give bayah. This is what they did because they weren't, they weren't wishy-washy people like us. We're wishy-washy. We say, I'm really with you, but we got other agendas and, you know, I ain't really around, you know, I'm, I'm just, I ain't really all about all this thing. You know, I'm just, I'll be here on Juma, I keep I'm doing you a favor by being at Juma. Right? This is the way we think. And so, we don't really commit to anything like this. And this is why we're in this situation. This is why black people are in this situation. They don't have no organization. They don't have no leadership. This is why Muslims are in this situation. We don't have no organization. We don't have no leadership. But the Muslims, we don't have any excuse. We have an organization. We have a leadership. We just don't choose to adhere to it. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gave us the answer. We just not practicing it. People don't know what to do. The bayah was serious. When the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam died, Abu Bakr became the Khalifa. Umar was calling people to the masjid, and every and he was come give the uh, the Khalifa Khalifa to Rasulullah come give him the bayah, and people came to give him and, and people was coming to give him the bayah. Ali heard what was going on, and. He rushed to put off the eating, barely put on his shirt. And he was delayed. These are notable people. Abu Bakr said, basically, is everything okay? You have something against me? Why are you so late? And he was like, no, no, I, I, no, no particular reason. I just neglected it. I rushed out here as quick as I could. You ain't going to hear that from all people, but according to the most authentic narrations, that's what happened. Most people have you believe he didn't get a bail or he waited six months and all that kind of stuff. God, that's not from Akhlas Umar and Jamaat. Everything we narrate is based upon Senate, based upon Islam. It was very serious. This is the way Muslims did things. And this is what brings about success. You see, after the Bayat al Aqaba, the first one and the second, you see how Islam took flight. 
Islam became real. You have some people, they, 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 they put their hands in it. Even the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, subhanAllah. The Treaty of Hudaybiyah, y'all don't understand what happened. What, what took place was Bayat al Rizwan. The, the Bayat, wherein Allah was pleased with them. Why did they take this Bayat? You see, I'm giving you these different circumstances because you got different types of Bayat and you see how serious they was. The Uthman Ibn Affan went into Mecca to negotiate. And a false rumor went out that Uthman was killed. And so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, we're going to avenge the death of Uthman, and, and uh, even if we all, we all die in the process. So he put his hand out, and everybody put their hands out. And all the Sahaba put their hands out. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam took his other hand, put it on top of their hands, said, this hand represents Uthman. And they took the bayat, the oath that they will die avenging his death. Turned out that it didn't, that it didn't happen. Uthman didn't, wasn't killed. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes reference to this in the Quran, Surah 48. And he says, Allah was pleased with those who took bayat to you under the tree. He was pleased. Wow, when you're serious about something, you swear to it. You ain't got to be like, you know, well, yeah, I'm with you. You swear? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> no, it was serious. And you see, after that situation took place, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people became Muslim. All of the scholars agree that that point right there, because what took place after that was the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, it was peace, and there was no open hostilities between the Muslims and the Quraysh. And because it was like that, people were free to travel, to come to Medina, and embrace Islam. So up until that point, you maybe had a few hundred Muslims. But after the treaty, who they, treaty of Hudaybiyah, thousands of Muslims. So by the time the Prophet died, 124,000 Sahaba. Most of them took Shahada after the treaty of Hudaybiyah. <coughs> what took place right before the treaty of Hudaybiyah? Bayat al Ridwan. The bayat, the bayat where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was pleased with the Sahaba. That situation was so significant that the tree that it took, that this took place under, that, because Allah mentions the tree in the Quran, Tahta Shajara, under the tree, where this bayah took place, it was so significant that after the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, people used to make zayah, they used to come visit the tree and go around, wow, this is where this happened with all the Sahaba to bear that, wow, mashallah, and it was starting to get a little bit too much, so Umar cut down the tree. You know, you know how y'all do. Y'all try to make anything into an object of worship. Just get rid of the tree. The tree is not what's significant. It's what happened under the tree that's significant. So we had the tree cut down. So why do we mention all of this? Because a lot of us feel disconnected from what's going on. We feel like, oh well, that's them way over there in Ferguson, Missouri. When your brother or your son get killed, then tell me how you feel. I know me personally, I have children of various ages, and most of the children that have been getting killed by police uh, lately, I got children the same age. So that could easily be any one of us. It could be me, a grown man that got killed, Eric Gardner that got choked out by police in Staten Island. It could be any one of us, old or young, criminal or not criminal. It could be any one of us. So don't think, oh, that's those people over there. It can just as easily be you. And then, when it does happen to you, may Allah forbid, if it does happen to you, you would appreciate if the Muslim was in, Muslims were in a uh, situation where they can come to some assistance for you, to you. Bismillah. <laughs>